Hi, everyone. This is Jennifer Bagnashi with Deep Believer. Today, our guest was a Scientologist in LA, California. She went from Scientology to the occult. In her life, she experienced so much paranormal activity and supernatural activity that it drove her to want to know more about Jesus Christ worthy. And so you're going to want to hear her story because she goes deep into her experience with the Scientology religion and with the occult and all the crazy things she experienced. You'll want to hear this. Her name is Candice Samira. Candice, thank you so much for being with us today. Oh, thank you, Jennifer. I'm so happy to be here. So tell us, what was your upbringing? What did it look like? I know you were in a multicultural household. What did your household look like? Oh, uh, well, it looked crazy. No, <laughs> um, no, it, it was a, it was a, it was a chaotic um, household. So my my father's from Hyderabad, India, and he grew up in a Muslim province. So he's Muslim by culture, and my mom was a Southern California native. Um, you know, born and raised, really Protestant upbringing, you could say. And um, it was me and three my three sisters and a bunch of animals. And um, yeah, so, but we were not raised with religion or, or any structure of that at all. And I remember you mentioning that your father is a Muslim and your mother was a Protestant. Did they ever talk about their cultures? Because I know you mentioned to me that they didn't really practice it, but did they ever mention Islam or Jesus in your household? Not really to my, to my recollection. Um, what I understood about Islam was, like I said, it was really more cultural. Like the one thing that we observed that my dad observed and had us observe as his children was to not eat pork. Um, people may or may not be aware that to this day, you know, Jewish people and Muslim people, they see pigs as filthy as they were in the Old Testament and they don't eat it. And that is carried over to today. So I grew up not eating pork bacon or ham or pepperoni. Um, which is fine because apparently it's not that great for you <laughs> anyway. Um, but that honestly was it. And if we visited my Indian relatives or we went to Indian weddings, you know, we would wear the traditional, the shalwar kameez and, and the clothes. And, you know, I had been to a mosque a handful of times. You, we, I understood that, you know, women had to cover up and stuff in that culture. But we were raised in Southern California in a very westernized um, environment. And my dad was totally fine with that while we were growing up so now what about your mom did your mom ever mention anything about her culture because i know your father was pro no pork and that was basically the muslim side of it but did your mom mention anything about christianity not really i i believe that she probably went to church with her family growing up like a handful of times like you know maybe for easter or a christmas service but no i don't remember the words the name jesus ever being uttered but what I did hear from my mom, and, and I didn't mention this to you when we spoke earlier, but um, my mom had a near-death experience prior to me being born. She she only had one of her daughters born at that time, and she had an ovarian cyst that burst, and apparently it was very painful. She was rushed to the hospital, and in their haste, they pierced her spleen, and she bled to death, and she was clinically dead for over a minute. And what she recalls was that white light that so many people say, you know, just like this tremendous white light and a, a sense of rushing at a speed, like an incomprehensible speed towards this light. And she heard my dad yelling her name. I guess he was in the hospital, you know, Diane, Diane. And she said the instant that she thought of him, she was back in her body. I had that imprinted in my mind at a young age, you know, of like, wow, you know, what was that about? So because of that, did you always believe in the supernatural? Yeah, I don't know if it was necessarily because of that. But yes, I was always, I guess there was some natural exposure to super supernatural things. Um, you know, yeah. Well, speaking of that, you mentioned that even from the time of you being in the crib, you experienced paranormal activity and you remember it. What was the first time that you remember paranormal activity? What did you see? How old were you? What was the scene like? All right. Well, I'm not sure how old I was. I, I remember that I was in my crib though. Um, I don't believe I was an infant, but I could have been um, two or three years old. 
And I remember my baby blanket, it was this yellow and white checkered blanket. And I was lying in bed and I woke up to a tall, just dark figure. There was no definition. I couldn't see a face or anything. It was just like a black figure standing at my crib. And I remember being completely frightened and pulling my baby blanket over my head and my feet hanging out, you know, pulling my feet up. And that's just the, a memory I have. That's it. I don't know what happened before or after that, but I've never forgotten that. Did you ever tell your parents about this or did you just keep it to yourself? Oh, I, I don't, I mean, I'm sure later, you know, definitely I've told my mom, but at that age, no, I mean. Of course, cause you were what, two, three years old. Yeah. I mean, I had, yeah. I, I don't, you know, it's like how you have a memory as a kid. You don't, it's just like this one little piece. There's no connection to what happened before or what happened after. I just have that memory, that picture. So you grew up in a household that was multicultural. You experienced the paranormal from the age of two or three. So you knew there was a spiritual realm there. And you one day you went to church with your friends or your friends would take you to church and all this stuff. Did that have any impact on you? Because I know your parents didn't take you. Did that have any impact on you at all? No, because I mean, I literally went probably like three times in my childhood with friends. Um, and, you know, you often churches when you're a kid, you're not even in the service, you know, you're in, you're in the Sunday school area doing crafts or something. So no, I, it had zero impact <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> okay. So when was the first time you heard about Jesus at all? Um, I, it was from my oldest sister. So my oldest sister is my mom's daughter from her first marriage. So she's quite a bit older than me, 12 years to be exact. And she had a turbulent relationship with my parents and they kicked her out at the age of 16. And she went and became born again, Christian. And she, she came back on a visit to me and she gave me a Bible, my first Bible I was ever given. And she taught me the Lord's prayer you know, our father who art in heaven. And she taught me that if I was ever scared to plead the blood of Jesus over my mind, my body and soul in the name of Jesus. And as a, you know, an obedient young eight-year-old, I memorized those things and I took it to heart. I had no concept or context. I tried to read the Bible, you know, I tried to read all the red. I, you know, she said, this is what Jesus said. Um, but honestly, what it mostly did is scare me. Because I remember one of the things she said is when, when you start to go after God, it's like the devil takes notice. And so it, it scared me that, oh, well, <laughs> I don't want to bring attention to myself to the devil. Um, so it was short lived, but that was the first, that's how I was in, initially introduced to Jesus. I feel like you have a very good sister because not only did she plant the seed that has later grown right now, but she prepared you for what was to come uh, unknowingly. So tell us about your Abraham Lincoln story. <laughs> okay. So also this was around the age of eight um, because I had a natural fascination for the paranormal. Um, I had a book on ghost stories and there were several stories in there about Abraham Lincoln and ghost sightings related to him. And I felt a connection to Abe Lincoln because we share the same birthday. And one night I was getting ready to go for bed and I had this like strange, excited, like almost butterfly feeling in my stomach. And it was like a knowing you're gonna see Abraham Lincoln tonight. It's just the thought that came through my head. And I thought, that's so odd. Like, what does that even mean? So I go to bed and sure enough that night in the middle of the night, I awaken to a dark figure, not unlike when I was you know, in my crib all those years ago, standing in my doorway and Again, couldn't see, it wasn't like I saw a beard or saw specific features, but there was that, um, you know, that tall hat that's so characteristic of Abe Lincoln. And it was just standing there and I was paralyzed with fear. And again, I just remember pulling the blanket over my head and just laying there until I went back to sleep. But you mentioned to me that you've heard many things about sightings of Abraham Lincoln. What were they? Because there was a connection you were mentioning to me earlier. Yeah, so I kind of always wrote off that experience as must have been my imagination because I read that ghost story book and, and whatever. And then many, many years later, I used to listen to a paranormal radio show on the AM station and they would often have people call in and stuff and talk about stuff like this. And apparently it's a, a somewhat common phenomenon, like 
specifically, they describe him as Abraham Lincoln or somebody in a top hat. And it's this dark figure often standing at the foot of their bed or something. And I, when I heard that, it was just like, I mean, it gave me chills because I was like, okay, <laughs> maybe that was not my imagination. I know that his wife was into seances when they were in the White House um, back in the day. Do you think that there's a connection with that, with people saying Abraham, quote unquote, Abraham Lincoln, where his wife was in the occult? Yeah, I think there definitely could be. Um, I can't say that I know enough about it um, to say definitively, but I would say, yeah, if she was messing around with that stuff, definitely a possibility. Okay, so tell us about the time when your mother brought home a particular book. What happened in your house or what happened to you when she brought home this book? Okay, um, so this is fast forwarding to, I was probably about 13, 14 years old. Um, and my parents had divorced and I was sleeping in my mom's bedroom this particular morning and she had bought several copies actually of a book called To Dance With Angels. And one of the most memorable things about it that I recall was the cover. It was like rainbow colors. It was like a picture of a face or like a profile. And it was all these different colors like in rainbow succession. And it, it kind of, it was supposed to resemble like a vibration. And it was called to dance with angels, as I said. And I woke up one morning early, like five or six. Again, it was like something awakened me and immediately drew my attention to the book that was sitting on her nightstand. And I just felt totally compelled to read it all of a sudden. So I picked it up and began to read it and read it cover to cover. It was over 400 pages in a weekend. And the book was filled with, um, you know, basically every new age concept you could imagine. It was a channeled book, meaning uh, the material was supposedly channeled through a spirit um, that was speaking through a human being, you know, a, a living person. That's what channeling is. And this couple, they were um, investigators and they wanted to learn more about channeling. This book was written in the 80s. That's when like Shirley MacLaine and all this stuff became really to the forefront kind of popular so they wanted to check it out and see for themselves and so they started sitting in on these sessions with this man who channeled a de deceased person who supposedly really existed named dr peebles and it was fascinating i mean what he would he was talking about what it was like in the afterlife in the spirit world and one of the reasons they had that image on the cover is because everything is vibrational and even how you would how you would like communicate with other people or spirits is like you would come into them and experience them. I don't, it, it was fascinating, but it introduced me to the concept of reincarnation and of course channeling and gave me a whole picture of what I believed for, for a long time after of what the spirit world and, and the afterlife looked like. But you mentioned to me that when she brought home this book, that opened doors in your house. I suppose there could have been a connection. I had strange experiences in that house as I did in every house. Um, so I don't know if it was specifically to that book, but what's more curious to me is how I was drawn to that book. I sometimes wondered if, you know, there was like a familiar spirit already attached to me that was sort of guiding me down this path. Um, you know, I have no way to prove that or know that, but, you know, just based on some other strange experiences. Yeah. Yeah. Which is why it's really important to be careful what we bring into our home, because, these are invitations that a lot of us sometimes unknowingly bring into our home. And then this is, this gives the devil legal right into our household and into our lives. Now, uh, around this age, you're a little older. You mentioned to me that you wanted to be an actress and you were mm -hmm. living in Los Angeles, California. And what a, I guess, fitting place to try to start is Los Angeles, California. So you went to acting school and became a Scientologist. Tell us about that story. Break that down for everybody watching. Okay. Um, so yeah, again, this was around the age of 15. You know, I had a very, I was living in a, a broken family. There was a lot of trauma in, in my life and things going on with my parents and my sisters. And I had a lot of emotion and a lot of um, angst. And I wanted to 
have a direction for it. And I had been a dancer and I still was at this time. And I always loved movies. I was raised on movies and it just seemed like the natural progression um, that I, I wanted to be an actor. I wanted to be a performer and, you know, emote basically. So I found an acting class um, through my friend's older sister that was in LA. And unbeknownst to me, because I was just really young and naive, it was based in Scientology. And so I joined this class and it was exciting because there were up and coming, you know, kid stars in there. And, and it was a female teacher and she was very strong, very dynamic. She was somebody that I really felt I could have a lot of faith in and I could trust and I could follow. And that was important because I was a, a lost 15 year old that had lost respect, honestly, for my parents and didn't feel that they were competent to help me in my direction. And I kind of felt like I was on my own and I was looking for an adult that I could trust and believe in. And so I gave everything to this woman. And sadly it was, you know, she was not a good person. She was manipulative and kind of egomaniacal. And I spent 10 years in that class and by way of that got involved in Scientology. And uh, there's something called the Celebrity Center in LA and it's basically designed, it was created for artists to go to. And I really, I got roped into doing these courses and programs and, and trying to make my way up the bridge, so to speak. You mentioned to me though, in order to progress in that industry, in that actual school, you had to convert to being a Scientologist. Pretty much. It, it wasn't stated so bluntly, but okay. So when I started this class, it, it was a teen class. So my teacher really taught somewhere else. And then she had this offshoot class for kids who weren't 18. So there was like 13 kids in this class and it was very intimate. And we were very involved with, with her and each other. And then she had a falling out with her teacher in the school that she taught at and then she became a scientologist and everything that she learned anything she was doing in her life she brought to us just like a family member might bring or parent might bring and so we were heavily encouraged and then everything about the outlay of the class even started to resemble more and more the scientology structure so even if you weren't going to the courses and quote unquote, being a Scientologist, you were being indoctrinated and influenced. But me, particularly being somebody who um, will want it, wanted to win, that was really my, my mentality. I wanted to succeed. I wanted to win. I, I'm, uh, you know, I wanted to perform at my highest. I'm going to do what this woman who I given all my trust and faith to um, told me to do. So tell us about Scientologists a bit or Scientology. Because when we hear about Scientology, the main thing or the main person most people think about is Tom Cruise. It's more than Tom Cruise. So could you tell us what is Scientology specifically? And tell us what you had to do to be initiated into it. Okay, well, Scientology literally means knowing how to know. It's like the science of knowing, understanding. And the founder and creator of Scientology was a man named L. Ron Hubbard. And there's sort of a um it's kind of a legend or a myth that the way it was created was he and a couple of other guys like jack parsons who had very occult ties by the way were sitting around and it was like you know the best way to make money is to start a religion i don't know if that's how it actually came about but l ron hubbard from all accounts that i can tell was truly a demented man he was he was in the military and apparently he thought, I think, that he was crazy and he did not have a good experience with psychiatrists, which is why he later on totally shunned psychiatry. And that's a huge part of Scientology is they don't believe in psychiatry or the use of medications, which, by the way, I don't particularly either. So I'm not that's one of the tricky things about Scientology is, is that like many things that are a deception, there's a lot of truth or validity or even possibly a positive aspect that can hook people. So there was that. He was also a science fiction writer. He had a tremendous imagination. And the more that I understand, of course, now about Christianity, the more I can see how, as many re religions do, co-opted so many things from the Bible and from Christianity. So the idea is that, and this is, this is so crazy, but, or outlandish, but L. Ron Hubbard would tell this story that there was, you know, this great sort of ancient battle a long time ago, and there was an explosion of a planet, and these spirits or whatever that lived on that planet are now floating all around in sort of our atmosphere. 
not unlike, you know, okay, there's demonic spirits around, right? But they don't use that terminology. And that they attach themselves to people and they call that engrams. So we all have these engrams, i.e. demonic attachments that we need to free ourselves of. So if you ever hear in Scientology that they wanna clear the planet or that you wanna get clear, what they really mean is free of these engrams or demonic attachments. But how, and then how they go about it is, so I was initiated, your first major course is, they call it the purification rundown. And again, it's rooted in some science and logic and has health aspects. And it attracted me as I'm sure is why it attracts many others. And the idea is that you have toxins from the environment, from legal drugs, illegal drugs, whatever, that literally store in your fat cells. They don't all get eliminated. And over time, these things build up and they cloud your um, ability to think clearly and to function clearly. So they do the purification rundown where they, they have you take niacin, which is a B vitamin that causes a, a flush and makes people red, and a couple of other vitamins, a lot of calcium, magnesium, stuff like that. And they would have you either run on a treadmill for 30 minutes, or you could go run around the block to get your blood flowing. And then you would go sweat in a sauna off and on for like five hours a day. And they would have this, they had the saunas on site at the celebrity center. And you would choose to do this. And it was very self-guided. You, you decided when you were done. Some people were doing it for three months. I think I did it for just over a month. I mean, it was, it was hard to keep up with. I mean, every day you had to make time to go do this. But the idea again is that you're sweating out all these toxins and then they give you an IQ test before the PRF, before the PRF, that's what they called it, and after. So that then they can say, well, look, your IQ has raised like three points because you, <laughs> you know, it was very gimmicky. But that, so that was the initiation to the bridge and really becoming serious in Scientology. Now, what's the bridge? You told me that there was something called the bridge in Scientology. Yeah, it's just, it's their way of saying, or like a ladder of going up the levels in Scientology because there are levels and you mentioned Tom Cruise, you know, my understanding is Tom Cruise is like way up there. They call it OT. I don't know what the highest OT is, but OT stands for operating Thetan. They call the spirit Thetan. Um, so you, you could be like OT8 and you supposedly can control what they call MEST. They're really into abbreviations and like kind of their own, you know, words for things. So MEST stands for matter, energy, space, time. So what Scientology, again, like so many other deceptions in the world today is really leading people to believe is that they are God, that they, you know, they can become God, they can become God-like. And that's, that's the goal of Scientology. Wow. Wow. So when you got into it, did you have to, were you hooked up to a lie detector test? <laughs> Yeah, so they wouldn't call it a lie detector test. They call it the e-meter. But yes, after every course, they would send you to the auditor, they called him, and you would sit across this auditor from a table with these cans in your hands, and they would ask you questions. And it basically is just reading if you if your heart beat suddenly raises or something, you know, something internally happens, that's all the meter is reading. They, it doesn't tell you, doesn't tell anybody like, oh, they're li they're lying or this is what they're thinking. It's just a Again, it's a gimmick. I think it's a gimmick. But yes, you had to do that after every completion of a course to make sure that you were fully complete. Mm, okay, so what type of questions do they ask you in order on the lie detector test? Being hooked up, I know they didn't call it a lie detector test. Did they ask you your deepest, darkest secrets? Did they ask you personal things? Did they ask what kind of things did they ask you? And what was the purpose of hooking you up to something like that? Well, so there's kind of two directions in Scientology too. So you could work personally with an auditor, which would be like a counselor, and you would have these, I believe, deep sessions where they might ask you things like that and expect you to divulge all this stuff. But of course, like everything in Scientology, it costs a lot of money. Um, so I, I never did that route. I mostly did low level courses because I didn't have thousands and thousands of dollars to spend on this. Um, so when I would be at the e-meter, it was just at the completion of a course and they would ask you very benign questions, you know, like, is there anything you didn't understand? 
they were really big on understanding, always looking up the meaning of words because L. Ron Hubbard would say, you know, if you had a misunderstood word, then you get tired, then you lose interest. Again, not in and of itself, not an evil or even necessarily wrong thought. But the main thing is that Scientology is totally devoid of God. I mean, they talk about infinity and they used to say like, oh, you could be a Buddhist Scientologist. You could be a Christian Scientologist. They don't care about your spirituality. They care about money and control. Now, when you were in this class that had you joined to Scientology, how was it for you? You being a 15, 16 year old girl, did you feel pressure being in the acting class? Because I know you were in there for quite some time. Was there pressure and how was that environment for you? Um, yeah, there was tremendous pressure. Like, um, you know, I was a very serious person. Life was heavy for me. And again, like I talked about wanting to fix things. So I went to this acting class, totally determined, you know, that I, I was going to be a successful actor. And <laughs> that's, that's a hard ambition because unlike, you know, becoming a doctor or something, and which obviously is very difficult. It's all, it's also a very prescribed path. You know, you you go to school, then you go to medical school, then you do this, you do that, you take these tests. With acting, I mean, it's a total wild card. It, there's no prescribed method, and and so I was holding on for dear life to to this woman, and and I had total faith in her. Like I said, I I really believe she had my best interests at all her students' best interests. I believe she knew what she was talking about. And I really felt if I just followed her and I listened to her, if I was obedient, um, that I would have success. And it that trust and faith that I placed in her was totally ab abused and misused. So it was very difficult because what, what became once a week then became three or four times a week. And then, you know, I was doing Scientology. We would do showcases, you know, where you um do little snippets of scenes you basically put on a show for and you invite producers and agents and people in hollywood to come see you and they would be big productions and even if you weren't performing in it she would make you participate and you were always working you were always it was a very work-based uh works-based situation you know and here i didn't believe in religion and i didn't really even know religion and i think i was totally caught up in it in this class. How did you leave Scientology? Because I know after a while you begin to realize that the environment became pretty toxic. How did that happen? Um, well, so I was in this class for 10 years. I had a short reprieve where I went to New York and I studied there, um, but I regretfully came right back to this class. I think because partially I had something to prove. I felt I had something to prove. And also it was just because what I knew. Um, but yeah, it became, all the joy, all the fire I felt that I had, passion for acting and, and my, my energy for it, it was dying. It was, it was almost completely put out. And I started to feel, I guess it was spiritually, I, like I was going to die. I, physically, I, there was nothing wrong with me. I was 25 years old, but I started to feel like I was going to die. Like there just was no purpose. I didn't understand <laughs> I was alive in a way. It was really kind of sad. And I heard a voice in my head, not audible, but I knew, I knew it wasn't my voice. And it just said, what about God? It was like, just this like whisper. And I remember, I remember the day that I heard it and it was like, it just woke me up because yeah, I, what, it, what drove me, what I believed always drove me was actually a pursuit of God. I didn't know I have my own definitions for God, but I believed in a God and I believed in a deeper purpose and meaning in life and that that was the foundation of my existence and why I would do things. And I realized I totally lost sight of that and had become almost completely disconnected. And that's what I think that death I was feeling is that my spiritual connection, whatever it was, almost stamped out. And when when I heard that, I knew, I mean, God was telling me, an angel, somebody, something was telling me, you're never going to find God on this path. And I just, I knew that. And I also heard this voice tell me, he, it said, who do you follow? And it, to me, it was so clear. It just opened my eyes that I, as I, as I said, when I spoke about this teacher, I was totally following her. All my faith was in her. She was my guru, so to speak. And I never questioned that. And suddenly it was like, this voice was saying, wake up, who and what are you following? Where, where are you headed? Because no, nobody else in my life was really speaking 
could speak into my life like that. So, I mean, I refer to this voice as an angel. And I actually, I looked up this uh, scripture because I, I had heard it before and I just thought it was so fascinating. It's Hebrews 1.14. It says, are they not all ministering spirits, talking about angels, sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? And I thought, you know, God is always looking out for us. And he, I, I do believe, you know, he he knows who's going to listen and who's not. And so I was nowhere in the mindset, but God was watching the whole time. And all I needed was that whisper, I believe, from an angel to wake me up enough that I was like, yeah, I got to get out of this class. This class is killing me. And it, it might sound silly to your to people listening out there um, because it's like it's an acting class. Give me a break. But my whole life um, had been constructed around it. I mean, all of my friends and relationships and what I did during the week was based around this class for 10 years now. And it, it was kind of like being in a prison of sorts. It definitely was a cult, which I just could not acknowledge that at the time. So when I decided that I had to leave, um, it's not like you just leave the class. You have to go through a whole process, or at least you're made to feel that you have to, or you're an evil person. And you're, you're um, a big thing in Scientology is what they say, being out integrity. You know, they get you on, you want to be an, you want to have integrity and you have to follow ethics, which again, on the surface sounds very good, right? But they manipulate it for their purposes. So when I called the officer, which was not our teacher, but somebody, another student who had been placed in an officer position of the class um, and said, I am not coming to class today, you know, I start getting grilled. Well, why not? What's going on? But, you know, the, and so I had to just admit, well, I'm not, I'm leaving the class. I, I'm not coming back. Oh, okay. Well, well, that's cool. That's fine. No problem. But the ethical thing to do would be to come in person and let your teacher know in person. And I mean, again, I, I'm a very ethical person. I believe I have integrity. And so that just gets me. I feel, I always feel like I have to follow procedure. You know, I have to do what is right. So I did that. And I show up to this class and she, the teacher's clearly talking about me to the whole class and wouldn't even let me sit down. I had to stand in front of the stage well, with all the students on the stage. And it was like a firing squad of accusation. You're leaving because of this. You did this to the class. You're a horrible person because of this. This, I mean, it, it was insanity. And I just had to stand there and take it. Or at least I felt I did. I feel like I could hear some people saying like, I would never put up with that. Well, you know, I don't know. I'm, I'm a stupid person in some ways, you know. Um, but I, anyway, I took it and then the class like went on break. And I went to go talk to the teacher, again, this teacher who was like a mother figure to me, who I had given 10 years of my life to. And I'll never forget when I looked into her eyes, like I was just looking for, you know, like a connection, like, what do I do here? You know, I just feel like I'm so lost. And her eyes were black. It was like they were dead. I, it was like she was looking through me. I, I will never forget that, Jennifer. And and I just knew, like, I have nothing to this woman. I've made her everything and I'm nothing to her. And um, so that was my last class. Did you, did you reach out to her after and tell her how you felt? No, no, there was never really an opportunity. There was sort of an, an exit procedure. Um, but no, I never, I never had a heart to heart with her or anything after that. Mm. Wow. Wow. Now, how about were you shunned by the other students because i'm sure you developed i remember you telling me you guys became like family now when you decide to when you decided to leave did they try reaching out to you after to have lunch or coffee or anything with you no it becomes very you know now you're a black sheep you can't you know you can't talk to that person that person is blacklisted and that's also a very scientology um they they encourage at least I encountered this, they encourage disconnection with relatives and anybody, again, labeling it, you know, that it's for your benefit. Those people are suppressive people, you know, they're out ethics, you can't associate with them. And again, it's a control mechanism. And fortunately, I never 
fell into that category. I never disconnected from my family or anything like that, but I was disconnected from the class. Now my roommate at the time and my good friend to this day um, was in the class at the time. And she continued in the class for a little bit. And it was very clear. I mean, pe people were making up stories about me and bad talk. I mean, it was just, it was so childish and elementary. And because I was one of the long-term students, when I left, I think it acted as a catalyst to kind of shatter a certain um, veneer or something that was or almost like a spell on the class. And slowly, one by one, other people started to leave until the real core of that group, which were these four brothers, I mean, the class disbanded. And so praise God for that. And I'm not saying that was because of me, but um, I think because I listened to that angel, whatever, you know, it, it was God working in some way. So, but I think she still teaches, you know, acting. I think she's still in Hollywood doing her thing, unfortunately. Um. Well, we'll keep praying for her salvation because we know she yeah. needs it. If she hasn't already, if she hasn't already. Now, when you left, did you realize or how did you realize Scientology was wrong? Did you realize it was wrong at that time? I don't think I was in, in the mindset of right or wrong so much or good or evil. To be honest, there was always a part of Scientology that weirded me out. And I never, honestly, and I never went around saying, I'm a Scientologist. I just was studying Scientology, you know? Now, maybe that's like a cop-out. Maybe that was a form of denial for myself, but there was always a weirdness to Scientology. I mean, if if you were ever on, you know, like at one of their centers, I mean, the way that the people that work there walk around, it's like, in some ways, they're like automatons. And it, it's so sad the way they rope people in. Their staff, they give them all these free courses, which they say, you know, this is worth $5,000. This is worth $10,000. But you get all of this for free, all this training for free, but you basically have to pledge your life. And not just this life, people sign billion year contracts. I'm not kidding. Because, you know, every single life you're now, you are married to Scientology. And these people are trapped in a prison. And at the Celebrity Center, the and there a lot of them were young people that worked at the celebrity center, lived in the apartment building across the street. And they were like serfs. They would come at like seven in the morning. They would clean the toilets. They would cook the food. They would do whatever. They would work all day at the celebrity center. And then at the end of the day, do their chores and then go back to the apartment building. These people had no life. And if they want to leave Scientology, do you know what's hanging over their head? Sure, no problem, but you owe us $50,000, $60,000, $100,000. Wow. Does that wow. sound wow. like a, a freedom giving situation? Does that sound like a good situation? No, it's all. So yeah. sadly, I mean, I was already aware of that. So it wasn't like I had any imagination that I was going to devote my life to Scientology. I was just trying to succeed as an actor, frankly. And I was gonna, willing to do whatever it took to get myself in a place where I felt I could be successful. And yeah, of course, look, Tom Cruise, John Travolta, Juliette Lewis, um, Kirstie Alley, you know, look at all these people. And I hear some now want to get out. They realize that it, it's it's not what, it was not where they're supposed to be. And we're praying for this, their salvation too. Yeah. So when you left Scientology, you went on to another extreme per se, you went into the occult. What did you go into specifically and why did you choose these? Okay, so so yeah, I left, for me leaving the class was automatic leaving Scientology. And yeah, I literally to this day still get phone calls from them. At one point when I lived in LA, they showed up at my door, but I didn't, yeah, but I didn't feel threatened by these people at all. They're just annoying, but I, and not to say that they aren't a threat. I mean, I've heard stories, but, I was a low, I'm like a low hanging fruit for them. You know, I'm not a celebrity. I didn't have a lot of money. I, in the scheme of things, I hadn't really invested a lot in terms of their eyes. So I didn't have that like experience, but I left and, you know, it's like, again, it's like a prisoner coming out into the world <laughs> in, you know, the first time in 10 years. And it's like, oh my gosh, what, what am I going to do? You know? And I, I went to a couple of other acting classes and I was really tired of being in an acting class, frankly. And I decided I was going to write a one woman show because I had a story to tell and I wanted to wake people up to, you know, Scientology. And I just, I had a story to tell and I, I'm, I'm a communicator. I guess I like to talk. 
So I spent the next several years um, working with various people, writing a one woman show. And it mostly was like therapy for me. I interviewed my mom, I interviewed my dad, I, you know, I interviewed some people from that acting class who since were gone and talked about their experience. And, and I wrote a one woman show and um, performed it a couple of times and only a couple of times. And my, my big performance where I was on a, you know, pretty good sized stage and we had an audience and my family was there and, and my husband and everything. And I did the show. I was thinking, I'm going to be so excited. And this is like the next chunk of my career, like the next 10 years, like I'm going to really work on the show and take it on the road and make something of it and myself. And I, I'll never forget again, the feeling I had when I was done was, I don't ever want to talk about this again. I don't, I don't want to relive this over and over. I want to move on with my life. And the reason that was significant is because it was finally when I allowed myself to admit that I was done with acting. Cause I, I don't like to think of myself as a quitter. I'm, and again, that was something that kept me in that class for so long is, um, I didn't want to be labeled a quitter. I don't quit is <laughs> it was, I guess my mantra. And now I, I had to just lay something down and I had to admit this isn't working. And so I'm sorry, you asked a question of how I got into the occult. Well, I was always kind of simultaneously interested in alternative information, whatever that meant, whatever was not on the mainstream and what everybody else thought. I was always digging it up and looking into it. And that's in terms of health and, um, you know, just societal things and our history, alternative history. And so I started thinking, well, what, what could I do with my life for a career? What else am I interested in? And I was thinking about acupuncture because I had some interesting experiences with acupuncture, but it was a little bit too clinical. I didn't want to be a doctor, like working with sick people. I'm more creative. You know, I want it to be more like kind of airy fairy and, you know, woo woo, basically, honestly. And so I got into sound healing and what sound healing entailed for me was actually the study of vibration, frequency, color healing, qigong, so movement in our body, um, astrology, Kabbalah, the use of instruments, you know, chakras, all the energy bodies. I mean, a whole field just opened up to me of basically energy healing. And what, for those who are listening, what is sound healing? What does it look like? What is it supposed to do? Okay. Um, well, there are different ways that people practice it, but the main idea is that s sound affects matter. So there's something called cymatics, and you can see these um, all over the internet. If you look up on YouTube, like where there's sand sprinkled on a plate, and then they put a frequency on, and when you hit a certain frequency, this the scattered sand will take shape into amazing, beautiful geometric shapes. That's called cymatics, okay? And interestingly, you know, people often refer to the, the biblical, you know, quote of how God spoke and the world became. So there is tremendous power in sound. Uh, sound affects matter. It, it affects our energy. So the idea of sound healing is to use sound, and also light is like a form of sound, you know, color, to move energy. And when you can move stuck energy, you can heal blockages. I'd say that's the basis of it. Wow. And I've seen that. I mean, you've seen it in doctor's office or in waiting rooms where you see. That's so amazing that you mentioned that. Well, uh, tell us this. Is it safe for children of God, Christians, to practice sound healing? Well, I mean, I'm going to say no. But I, I kind of sigh because it's such a heavy and sort of complicated topic. From my experience and and everything that i know and that it's connected to I, I mean absolutely not but even once i was saved and i remember talking you know talking to other christians about like i've just got to get rid of these instruments whatever they're like what in instruments are you know god created instruments you know sound sound is of god and yes that is true that is correct but the the most deceptive thing about that whole field that i was in which was very spiritual wasn't just about sound healing is that we were worshiping creation and an aspect of creation never acknowledging the creator and 
that can be in some ways the most dangerous way to go because it's like, and I wrote, I, I wrote this uh, scripture down because again, it was reminding me, it's like, it says having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. We are practicing and we are using the tools of God, but we give no acknowledgement and ultimately are totally disconnected from him. And that was the perspective that I saw it from. So I knew um, when I met Jesus that there was no way that I could stay connected to that. It's amazing how the devil allowed you to accept everything else except Jesus. What else were you into? So you were into sound healing. I know you mentioned that and you mentioned others, but what else were you into? Well, again, for me, the sound healing was many things. I mean, we studied astrology, Kabbalism, we were doing Qigong, we were communing with the divas and the fairies, you know, the, the elemental spirits, nature spirits. We were doing shamanic practices. Um, I became a yoga instructor and I started to teach yoga. Um, it, we used color for healing and my particular teachers um, taught that the color rays are like, are alive. Um, there's a whole teaching into that. I mean, it just goes very deep um, into the spirit spiritual realm and, you know, that we have multiple spiritual bodies and how do you reach into each of those bodies and move energy. And, and you say that, you know, that it's interesting that the, the devil allowed me to get into everything. That's his um, biggest trick. It's not just me. That's why that's why I decided to contact you and thought maybe I could actually be on the show because we are in a time where I see, I mean, when you look at the political situation and stuff, if you start to look into it, people say, oh, they're Luciferians and stuff. Whether you believe it or not, these people are religious. They do have a doctrine that they follow. And I believe, I don't know if we're going to see it in our lifetime, if it's going to be in our children's lifetime, but this new age stuff, these Luciferian beliefs, um, this form of godliness that really is not connected to God at all is what is going to deceive, I believe, on a mass scale. And that's this love and light, you know, and tolerance. And it has, you know, it has these headings of good, but it's actually the opposite and it and it's so deceptive it's so deceptive because it feels good and it sounds good and it even looks good how are you supposed to know otherwise yeah that's good that's good so take us to when you moved to washington state what happened to make you jump ship all right so uh, now I'm married to my wonderful husband and I'm really into the sound healing. I've become certified, you know, I've gone through their certification process and uh, we've created a space in our home and I'm giving at home sessions, you know, far from like having a business or making a career. But this was my end goal, my hope that I could um, make a living off, you know, introducing people to spirituality and healing and, you know, all of this stuff. And we were about to have our first child. I was pregnant and long story short, we ended up on a reality show that had to do with cats. And we thought it was a totally benign thing and it turned into a debacle that made it pretty much impossible for me to have people over to our house or to do this sound healing business. I'll just put it, leave it at that. And it was so, discouraging and disheartening that I was like, I am done. I am done with Hollywood, like even a little bit, like I want nothing to do with it from any angle, any connection. It's evil. And the people, you know, not everybody, but the, the promotion behind what Hollywood actually represents, what it was founded on, what it is, I believe is evil. Again, it's, it's a trick of the devil, you know, it's light and it's a trickery, <laughs> you know, I'm sure, I'm sure many people have heard, you know, even Hollywood, it's that it's a stick that magicians use. It's a magician's trick and it's a gross place. And, um, anyway, it just turned out that my husband and I were having a, our first child and we couldn't find a place to live that we could afford where we felt we even wanted to raise our daughter. So my husband's from Washington state. So, um, we decided to try Washington. And that's how we ended up here. And we've been here over nine years now. So you moved to Washington State and you get even more heavy into yoga. Really quick, 
explain yoga. I, it, it's very popular in the United States, and we know it's heavy in the Eastern world, but could you explain yoga to people? Because there are Christians who, there are churches who do yoga. There are Christians who call it Christian yoga. Um, if you tell them that, you know, yoga isn't of God and whatever, they'll say, well, I'll just think about Jesus while I'm doing it. Tell us the truth and the dangers of yoga that people think is just so lighthearted. It's just exercise. And is it just exercise? No, it's not just exercise. So yoga at its core, at its foundation is a spiritual practice. Yoga means to be yoked. So first question you'd have to ask is, well, what are you yoking yourself to? Okay. Um, I didn't start practicing yoga until later in my life because I was a dancer and I felt I had no need for yoga. When I got into yoga, it was specifically because I could see that it was a spiritual practice that was starting to become mainstream. And my goal was to, um, you know, again, have this business uh, be in the world of spirituality. And how was I going to find my clientele? Well, being in a yoga studio, I saw as a prime opportunity. And so I finally was like, I think maybe I should get into this yoga stuff. And I mean, and I do appreciate the physical aspect. I mean, again, like so many things, it's not that there are no benefits, but should a Christian be involved in yoga? Absolutely not. And I made a video on that and, um, you know, of course get a lot of pushback, but no, because at its root, it is spiritual. There are eight limbs to yoga. The, the physical that we see, the, the asanas, that's just one limb. And if you were to go to India, they would, they would tell you that the, many Indians are actually very angry with the way that the Western, Western civilization has appropriated or misappropriated the use of yoga and turned it into exercise and uh, basically purely a physical thing. So people can think that they can divorce themselves of that or they can play worship music or they can say, Jesus, 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 and do the moves. And I've used, this analogy came to me, and, and forgive me because of the crassness of it, but it's like, do you think that it's okay to view pornography if you say Jesus, Jesus, Jesus the whole time? Is it not pornography anymore? No, of course not. That's ridiculous. So that's when people say that, you know, Christian yoga, it's an oxymoron. It's just... You, the two are not together. And in, in fact, I knew this so well because of all the workshops and things I did that I actually held a workshop at my yoga studio. Of course, this was pre being saved um, where we were holding poses and I would expound upon the meaning of the pose and the God that it was connected to and the deeper spiritual meaning, because this is true. This is what it's founded and rooted in. So to me, again, when I got saved, there was I mean, it was difficult because my vanity was connected to it. I was doing hot yoga and I'll, I'll be honest, I never felt so good physically in my body, like so flexible, so strong, my hips that hurt like after childbirth birth and whatever. I mean, no pain in that sense. But I, I didn't think for a second that I could keep doing yoga and really be walking with God as a, you know, a Bible believing Christian. And funny aside, um, I had a, a weak moment um, after I was saved and we took a trip. We drove to Northern California where I have some family and, you know, it's a long car ride from Washington and my body was hurting and I had been to a, a hot yoga studio up there by my mom before. And I was like, oh, I remember I went. It was very like not, you know, not yoga-y, not spiritual. And I told myself it was OK to go and I just needed to like stretch my body. And, you know, it's funny, Jennifer, I went in there. And it wasn't like I remembered. There was this huge statue at the front of the room and like a, you know, like a Buddha in a lotus position or something. And I was kind of late to the class. So I had to put my mat in front of this statue at the very front. I felt so uncomfortable. I stupidly, I did stay for the whole class because I'm stubborn. But I mean, I was feeling so convicted the whole time. And then at the end, they did some weird chant where they banged on the ground. I remember I rolled up my mat and I ran out of there and I repented and I said, never again, Lord, I got the message loud and clear. So even when you think, oh, I'm just gonna, no. Don't dabble. Don't dabble. That's, that's really good. Now you've mentioned hot yoga and I know we went over this. <laughs> Explain to viewers who have no idea, who have no 
no information on yoga based on what we see in stores and what people see, what we see on commercials or TV or studios, or whatever. What on earth is hot yoga? Hot yoga is a style of yoga that's done in a very well heated room. So you are dripping sweat and it's not for everybody. It, Bikram is really the style of yoga that started that and it's intense, but I'm from Southern California. I've got Indian blood. I need sun, I need heat. Living in damp, cold Washington, I was like, if I don't sweat, I am gonna lose it. So when I found hot yoga, it was like, felt like it was saving my life. So again, it was, it was a big thing for me to drop. And I was also teaching, I was getting free classes and teaching and I, I, I went to that yoga studio and I remember I pulled the owner aside and I said, I can't teach anymore, I'm not doing yoga anymore, I met Jesus. <laughs> How did they take that? I mean, because did it sound? I'm sure to them it sounded crazy and religious. But how did they take it when you told them? So this I'm is exactly yoga for what Jesus. she said. She uh -huh. goes, "Good for you, honey." <laughs> and then she goes, "You know, try not to think so much." <laughs> Bless her yeah, heart. Exactly. You know, just don't turn your brain off. Don't think. From there, you are married to your husband and you became pregnant. And for your first pregnancy and your second pregnancy, they were very difficult. And you say you felt like they were linked, the difficulties were linked to something. What do you feel like the difficulties during childbirth and pregnancy had to do with? Well, again, I'm not sure. So my first pregnancy and uh, child was born in Los Angeles when I you know, and, and all through my pregnancy, I was doing Qigong and doing my sound healing practices and stuff. And actually the pregnancy was very smooth. That first pregnancy, the birth was super traumatic. There was a lot of problems. And yeah, I just wonder if I, you know, opened myself up to, to that, um, just because of what I was involved in, but I'd never made that connection at that time. Now in Washington, I became pregnant with my second child. And again, I was, I, I went to Switzerland when I was three months pregnant doing these shamanic practices and, um, you know, working with elements and all this stuff. And maybe that had something to do with what was, what was going on. Um, you know, it's hard to say because people have issues all the time, but I guess I do tend to believe that most things are spiritually rooted. So it's possible. It's more than likely actually that what I was experiencing was connected. Um, but it was like everything that could go wrong was kind of going wrong. You know, oh, you have a heart murmur. Oh, you're hypothyroid. Oh no, you're preeclampsia. Oh, your blood pressure, it won't come down. You're getting migraines, uh, this, that, you know, and it just was like a constant, like, oh, what is going on? Fortunately, the birth um, was not the trauma that it was the first time. It was sort of in, you know, inverted. The birth was um, good for, for my son. I was having a migraine, like literally as he was coming out and they shot me full of um, basically that salt water stuff, you know, to open your veins. Cause she, you know, they were, when you have high blood pressure, they're so paranoid, you're going to have a stroke. So she shot me full of that magnesium stuff. And then you can't, you're like desperately thirsty and you can't drink water for 24 hours. It, it was awful. But even after the birth, my health things were not resolving. I continued to have high blood pressure, which I never had high blood pressure in my life. And it was so freaky because they were trying, they, you know, the medical, my doctors and whatever, trying to convince me to get on blood pressure lowering medication and I'm breastfeeding. And if you don't know, it also lowers the heart rate of your nursing child. And I was literally at the pharmacist, like giving him the prescription and like, no, I can't do this. And so that was actually how I came to hot yoga because I was like, I have to take this, my health into my own hands. These doctors are just going to give me pills that aren't going to do anything. And I've got to get healthy. Like, I don't know what's going on. So um, that's when I got into hot yoga and started sweating and I started taking herbs for my kidneys and stuff. And I brought my blood pressure down in a totally natural way. Um, but that just got me on, on that path. But there's even, even in the health world, even in the holistic world, you can be deceived or you have to be careful because you can have a lot of success and you can do a lot of things to really help yourself. But then you can become, it becomes, a oh, I'm responsible for everything. I, there's something, if I do this thing, it's going to fix me. That's going to fix me. Again, you lose God in that pursuit. And I see, I see even Christians today that I personally look at and I go, I, 
why, why are you on your knees praying first? Why is it, why are you so obsessed with your diet or so obsessed with this holistic thing or that holistic thing? And I'm not going to sit here and say, it's evil to go to an acupuncturist or to go to this. People have to make up their own minds and, and they have to, it's between them and God. Um, do I do that? No. Amen. And if anybody's thinking about trying out hot yoga, please do not do it because you're open right. door that you will want closed. <laughs> yes. If you like the heat, I like the heat too, just like Candace. But if you want to do any kind of yoga, please don't do it because you'll regret it. Um, Candace, regret, many people regret it and you'll enter into um, a phase of life where you don't, you don't even have to go into if you just stay clear of it. So thank you, Candace, for elaborating on that. If there's any Christian out there who is struggling, like, you know, I love my yoga. I love this. And it doesn't just have to be yoga. We have, we, I believe are called as Christians to question, what is it that is an idol in our life? If there's anything that you feel on one hand, God is convicting you to let go of, and yet you're arguing with him, you got to look at that and say, why? It, it obviously has a negative hold on you and, and could be considered an idol. Um, and, and that's my point, greater point with the holistic field or even, you know, being obsessive about your diet or whatever. It's easy for these idols to come in. And that's what we have to be watchful of. I agree. I completely agree. You visited Arizona for a healer. What was wrong with you? It was something wrong with you where you visited a healer in Arizona and this opened your eyes to the truth. What happened to you? All right. Um, and just to clarify, I did not visit her in Arizona. We did a phone, we did a phone healing, um, but she was in Arizona. You're correct. Um, what was wrong with me? Well, it, again, it felt like um, everything. No, uh, energetically. So again, this is my field. This is how I can in life. It's just how I function. You know, I'm like a spiritual feely person. And I just felt like stuff was off energetically, you know, I, I'm off. And I started to have some weird sleep paralysis dream stuff again, which I've had periodically throughout my life, but then it'll be dormant for a long time. So I, yeah, I had a couple of like bizarre experiences and I just felt like some, something's on me or some, you know, I need to get I need to cleanse. I need to get cleansed. And I had heard this woman on an internet radio show that I listened to. And she sounded fascinating because what she did supposedly was to, um, clean your aura of implants. So not like physical implants, like, oh, I've been abducted and I have an alien implant, but um, etheric. So again, if when you're in in the energetic understanding and belief system, you have all these energy bodies and the etheric, you know, it's the unseen, but it's still part of your, you know, your body, so to speak. And you can have implants, things, energies, maybe even spirits, you know, like lodged in here that you're carrying around with you and causing disruption. And this is sort of how she explained it. And that really resonated with me. So I decided to contact her and do a session with her. And I had never done anything quite like this. I mean, of course, you know, I had done sound healing sessions and, and other things, but I hadn't done anything quite like this. And I didn't really know the woman from anything. I just, again, being a feeling person, I'm like, I feel I should do this, you know? So we set up the phone consultation and I have my husband take our kids out of the house and I'm alone in the house. And I was really ill this day, like had a terrible cough and um, didn't feel well, but I thought I'm going to feel better after I do this session. And it basically consists of her doing a guided meditation, you know, of protection. Again, that's big in the energy healing field is, you know, you, you use your mind's eye and you do these uh, you envision protection around yourself, usually using like a golden light or a white light. And so she had me envision putting on these golden gloves and I had a golden vacuum and she would guide me through my body and say like, you now pinpoint, is there any place where you feel a pain? And so I would, you know, I have my eyes closed and okay, I feel pain in my ankle. All right, put your attention on that pain. Now, does the pain stay there or does it move? Oh, I just felt it move, like now it's in my hip. Okay, so follow it to your hip. And I'm like chasing, pain around my body and then when it, like i can basically corner it it's like okay now vacuum it up <laughs> you know and then and then it just kind of dovetails into all this stuff of like what you see and like wormholes and this and that i mean it just got kind of crazy and it went on for four hours and at one point during the session like i felt like a presence like a a dark presence enter the room and i just i didn't know jennifer if i was imagining this or i didn't know what was happening 
And I was even telling her like, I don't know, this, this seems kind of crazy. I don't even, I don't know if this is real. And she was just kept, oh, def no, I've done so many of these sessions. This is real. I've heard all this before, blah, 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 blah. Anyway, four hours, we got to go. I had to go to work or something. And we didn't complete the session. I don't know what I was supposed, I was supposed to feel all clean of the spirits or something. I don't know, but it wasn't working. And she said, well, I'll tell you what, if you have time tomorrow, we can continue so we can finish our session tomorrow, no extra charge. So I'm like, okay, well, she sounds like that sounds very um, noble of her. So I will take her up on that <laughs> offer. So we did the same thing, repeat um, almost exactly and went on for another several hours. And it was like, there was just no end to anything. And actually when that, when that dark presence that I felt entered the room, I sensed, that he was laughing. I sense it was a he or something laughing. And it was like, he was telling me you're, you're never like laughing at me. Like you're never going to accomplish what it is you want to accomplish. It just felt futile basically. And it was because it, it didn't help me at all. We, we ended the session with her saying, I've given hundreds of these sessions and I've never not finished with somebody. And so of course I felt totally like, uh, defeated and like, well, uh, what do I do? Do I can't continue on my own or call you again? And she really didn't have an answer for me. I mean, she wasn't, it didn't sound like she was trying to get my business or get money out of me because she didn't say, call me again. She was kind of like, well, I don't know. <laughs> and a quick aside, I always remember she said this too, that most of her clients are Christians. Wow. Wow. And that's very telling because unfortunately wow. there are too many people calling themselves Christians walking around today that don't know the power in the name and the blood of Jesus. Amen. And that is heartbreaking to me. And that's 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 another thing I would hope to impart is that when I came to Jesus, I knew the supernatural existed in a very real way. And it it really pains and saddens me to see Christians that have such a powerless understanding of the gospel and who Jesus is. Mm -hmm. Which is why you're sharing your testimony. So thank you so much for this, Candice. Yes. But you mentioned to me that when you were doing these rituals with her or whatever you call them, you saw snakes come toward you in the spiritual realm. Well, so no, so this was after we completed the session. And as I said, how it ended. And then that night um, I went to bed, you know, and I went to go to sleep and I couldn't sleep. I, and I, I don't really know how to describe it. It was just, my mind was in such turmoil, eyes open, eyes closed. Yeah. I was just seeing like snakes come at me and like horrible images. I was just being spiritually attacked. That's the only way I know how to explain it. And it went on for hours and hours. I was tossing and turning and I was, you know, uh, yelling out to God, not, not out loud, not like, God, help me or Jesus, because I didn't really have that frame of mind. But I was, you know, God, give me white light of protection, cleanse me. You know, I probably said I plead the blood of Jesus because that was in my arsenal from the time I was eight years old, even though I didn't even know what that meant. Um, I was just kind of throwing everything at it, but nothing was giving me relief. And I, just the way I recall it, it just went on for hours, tossing and turning. I was being tormented, but it was like, there was nothing there, but there was something there. And it was just like, you know, like you think you have a bug on you, but you can't find it, you know? And it was crazy making. And I finally got out of bed. It was probably like five or six in the morning. And I went and laid myself on the couch in exhaustion. And I finally fell asleep for a couple of hours. And when I woke up, it was like, oh, it wasn't just a nightmare. Like that really happened. And I was scared because I was just like, I, I was not prepared for that. And another important thing to say, you know, in, in all my spirituality and new age pursuit, um, it's all love and light. And they, it's not that they don't acknowledge that there is some dark, but they, at least in my teaching, like they did not want to talk about it. We don't talk about it. You just raise your vibration high enough and those things can't get you is basically the teaching, which is nonsense. It's a total denial. Mm -hmm. um, but that worked for me because I was I didn't believe in evil. To me, you know, good and evil and the battle of light and dark um, seem really like uh, childish, you know, like fairy tale stuff. So I, I didn't allow myself to acknowledge that there was evil. And if I was having a negative experience, well, it must be something in me that's off, you know, my vibration, you know, my vibes I need to raise, <laughs> you know, it's just silly. So when this happened, it's like, it's paradigm shifting because it's like, hold on, nobody told me, 
Like, why is this happening? Nobody told me that this could happen, would happen. This is not within my paradigm. So it shook me. And I heard that voice again, that small, still voice. Um, you know, as it says in the Bible, whether it was an angel, God's voice. I don't know why I just sense more that it was an angel. I didn't, I feel a different feeling when I feel like I hear from God. But um, I heard a voice say very clearly, go to Barnes and Noble and get a Bible. And so I listened, because like I said, I was kind of in a desperate state. And so I very obediently went there and I bought an NIV because I wanted a, <laughs> a Bible that I could understand. Wait, but um, how did I you didn't... even know that an NIV, because you didn't know much about the Bible, how did you know NIV was, was because, more? Because mm -hmm. when my sister gave me that Bible when I was eight, it was a King James Bible. And that was one of the things it was like, what is this language? Like, I cannot understand this. And I remember my mom always saying, the only Bible to read is the King James Bible. Um, she, she would say that later. And I know it sounds funny because like she she would say that and that, I don't think my mom's ever read the whole Bible. I mean, again, that was just stuff from her childhood, you know, like, you know how you just get bits and pieces and it's not connected to anything. It doesn't make any sense. So I always felt like, oh, well, the King James Bible is the only Bible. But I was like, I'm going to break tradition and I'm going to get a Bible that speaks English, <laughs> regular English. <laughs> Well, actually, I feel like Americans, we have the bootleg English in English. <laughs> I get what you're saying. Right, that, right. The, technically, it may be the other way around. But you know what I I'm saying. It. I it was get like, it. I and, get and just for anybody listening out there, I know that particularly Baptists are like King James only Bible. And I think that there's a decent argument for that. Um, I read the NIV and I know it it leaves stuff out and stuff. So I, I think that ultimately you should just keep reading and reading and read read all the Bibles that you can read. There you go, different um, versions, yeah. Yeah, but when you just need something, you know, you need a little bit of milk, a little bit of sustenance, it's better than nothing. I brought it home and again, being kind of a very linear person, I was like, you know, open up to Genesis <laughs> and I'm just going to read the Bible from front to end. And I, it maybe lasted two weeks. And I mean, nothing was making sense to me. And I think that there's real truth in this, you know, that when, when you don't have the Holy Spirit, you cannot understand the Bible. It doesn't make sense. And it literally, I mean, it did, it, it, it stirred such an anger in me, like a hostility that I, I loathed the Bible. I, when I looked at it, like I literally felt a deep, like, just a loathing. I don't know how to explain it. Like I wanted to throw that book against the wall. Like, but how was your heart when you read it? Did you have a prideful heart when you read it or were you really receptive of it? Oh no. I, th I think totally prideful. Totally. I still was so full because I was not saved. I, um, I just heard this voice and thought, oh, get a Bible. And because, you know, I like to read and I like to gather information. And so I was looking at it like, okay, well, what can this Bible tell me? What, you know, how can this Bible explain what's going on with me? And that's not the heart or the spirit to read the Bible in at least not solely. And so, yeah, full of pride, full of all this false information and preconceived notions that I had. You know, I'd never read the Bible, but I had watched hours and hours of videos telling me what the Bible said and what it meant, you know, from this perspective and that perspective. So I thought I knew. I thought I knew. Uh, super arrogant. I mean, there was a lot of pride and a lot of arrogance that had to be um, humbled out of me before I could be receptive. So this was not the time. Um, so yeah, so I set it down and I, I, um, I felt I needed to recommit myself to my spirituality, that really what was going wrong was that I wasn't meditating enough. I wasn't doing enough, you know, Qigong. Uh, <laughs> I needed to really get back and embrace those ideas that we create our own reality, you know, that we're responsible for our lives and, and what happens and, and um, I just need to stop, you know, kind of being a wimp or something. <laughs> okay, so after that, you stopped reading the Bible for a bit and you went on YouTube for a guru. What kind of guru was this? And what did you realize when you started listening to this guru? I decided I had a, a great idea because I have great ideas um, that usually lead to disaster. <laughs> Historically, you know, all my ideas um, that I'm going to start my own YouTube channel where I can expound and share on all of my knowledge. You know, I've spent so much time and money at this point um, and hours on pursuing this spiritual knowledge. Now it's time for me to share 
and and you know give back or you know whatever it really probably was like you know i'm trying i'm still desperate to have some purpose behind learning all this stuff and maybe this is another avenue for a career or something you know it was my thinking so i sought out two guys actually they work in tandem and they have very popular channels of their own on youtube doing this kind of thing you know um, razor vibration kind of stuff and all the new age stuff and they were selling a program where they would teach you how to create your own channel and become successful doing that so i started doing that with them and started filming my own videos and you know i, I didn't get i mean i i wasn't very successful and i, I never even finish the program, I don't think, but as, as I was pouring into it over time, you know, I'm doing these meditations and really trying to boost myself up again with all, like puff myself up with this, with these processes, rituals, whatever. Um, yeah, I started to, there was like a resistance forming. I, one, I was learning that my sound healing teaching, much of what I had, that the, my teacher's teaching was based on other teachers like Alice Bailey and Madame Blavatsky, as I started to look into them, I started to learn some disturbing information about what those teachers represented and what they were connected to, which um, in short was Luciferianism, that they believe that Lucifer is the true savior of mankind as the light bearer, um, that he enlightened humanity and this is who they worship. Now, again, I, I didn't have a religious mindset, so I wasn't sure what I thought about it, but so, it didn't quite sit right because, you know, of course you've heard the name Lucifer, whether you're religious or not. Everybody's heard of the devil, whether you're religious or not. So it's like, huh, well, what, what do I believe about this? Like, am I gonna align myself with this philosophy? So I reached out to my sound healing teacher, who again, I've been a student of hers for over six years, and just in an email, you know, like, hey, I, I heard this about, you know, I read this about these teachers. What do you have to say about it, basically? And it was her response that was very telling because it, it was very brief. It was very abrupt. And it was basically like, no, I never heard that. Like, that's nonsense or something. And I thought, well, either way, that was a poor answer in my estimation, because one, how could you be involved in this? For 20 some years and not know that connection then you're not you're not very um observant or you don't, you're not very knowledgeable about what you're connected to and that's not good or two you're lying to me and you don't want me to know about that connection and why would you do that so this started creating a mistrust for me with the sound healing stuff that had always been in my again consideration so amazing and beautiful and wonderful it was like the chink in, in the armor like something's not right and now and then i'm doing these videos and i literally am setting up to do the video one time and i i hear in my head it's the blind leading the blind <laughs> I'm like what not knowing you know okay and i wrote this down i'm not i don't have all these scriptures memorized just so people know but um it's Matthew 15, 14, let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. And oh, I just got chills. Thank God, you know, because I was leading other people astray in my ignorance. And, you know, God cared enough to warn me. <laughs> You know, I was being warned and I didn't even know. I was just, I was like caught, I was like literally, I think there was the soul. I mean, the battle was on for my soul. It was like an angel and a devil on each shoulder and stuff was going on and I was just caught in the middle. And I, I didn't, as spiritual as I was, I had no clue that that's what was happening. And I was doing my meditations and I started having a lot of sleep paralysis again and spiritual attacks. Um, and I started going into a depression, which I had never experienced before. I just, it was kind of like that feeling again when I was in the acting class and felt like spiritually something was dying. It was like the me, the essence of me was dying. My soul was dying, the fire of my spirit, something. And I couldn't explain it. I didn't know what was happening outwardly in my life. Nothing was wrong, um, but internally I felt so desperate and depressed. Wow. Wow. So then, 
from there you begin, well, from there you begin to start doubting new age altogether. When your life started to fall apart spiritually, you begin to doubt what made you start doubting. Okay. Everything that I've been practicing for all these years may not be the truth. With the, with that kind of thinking with the new age thinking and you know, you might hear a lot of people say like, it's the universe. You think, you know, you're being rewarded by the universe and there's karma and it all seems like it's so measured out when you're suddenly in a dark place or you're having a dark experience, there are no tools because basically what you're told with that philosophy is, well, you're doing something wrong. It was the same thing in Scientology. If you're having a hard time, you're doing something wrong or somebody in your life is like, suppressing you and you need to get rid of them. In new age, if you're experiencing dark things or sleep paralysis or whatever, you're doing something wrong. You're wrong is basically what it starts to come down to. And so here I was outwardly working so hard, doing everything that I knew to be right, you know, meditation and yoga and eating well and doing, making the videos and you know, I'm such like an upbeat, positive, high vibration person. And the more I strove to be that, the worse I became because it was like, it was empty. And it, God was bringing me to the end of myself. Sorry, I'm getting emotional, but okay. um, because again, I was so blind. I was so lost and thought that I knew it all or that I could know it all. Like if I just had enough knowledge you know, I would be able to save myself. I would be able to fix myself. I would be able to do all the things that needed to happen for me to have a healed life. And it was backfiring. And I, I mean, I was not 25. I was 40 years old when this happened. I had been married for some time, two kids. I mean, what is happening? What am I doing? I, I can't start over again. I felt like a total failure and I just couldn't admit to anybody that this stuff that I was wrong, like that I had already felt that I had failed many times in my life. When I had to say that I'm not going to be an actor anymore, that that was the wrong path for me. It was hard because I felt like a failure. And what I did for a long time was delivered food as a delivery driver and worked in restaurants. It was hard to just like be that and nothing else. And here I was again, I, worked so hard, you know, to do all the things and wanted to do this and it wasn't coming to fruition. And was I really going to have to face, you know, my family or my husband or whatever again and say, I can't do anything with this. Like I suck. <laughs> it's, it, it was just that all of that was on me, you know, and I didn't know why it was happening. And it was driving me to, to such a desperate place that I wasn't even telling my husband. And at night I was going downstairs in this particular house that we rented and just bawling because I had nothing else. I didn't know what to do. And one of these nights, it wasn't like a conscious, I didn't think it out or plan it. It just thank God that he was listening. And I, I just said, Jesus, if you're real, like I need to know, I need to know right now. It just came out of me, like Jennifer, like it, it was in my cells of my body. It was in everything. You know, I've, I've had people say to me like, well, I've done that. Nothing happened. And I say, I'm sorry. Keep asking. I don't, there's no formula. It's just when you are at the end of yourself, I, you know, I, you, I'm telling this story. So, you know, that it didn't happen overnight. It took my whole life. It took 40 years for me to get out of my stubbornness and get out of my arrogance and my ignorance and thinking um, that I knew how to do it and that I could do whatever I wanted in life because life is just for us to do whatever we wanted. And frankly, I thought that anybody who was religious, particularly Christian, particularly if they believed in Jesus, it's only because this is what I thought. They had never been exposed to anything else and they didn't know anything else and they were sheltered and they were small minded and maybe even stupid. That's what I thought. And so everything that I did was to run away from that, to not be that. And look where it got me. Totally, I didn't even believe, I didn't even believe in God anymore, to be honest. I realized that God had become this totally impersonable, impersonal, intangible thing. One minute the universe loves you, the next minute he's dropping you. And it's your fault. You can't cry out to the universe. Universe doesn't hear you.
So that's where I was, total desperation, and it just came out of me. Jesus, out loud, came out. And he answered me, praise God, he answered me, which I, I never expected in a million years. 32 years later, from when you were eight years old, you remember that one name, Jesus. What did Jesus say to you? First of all, it, it was his presence that entered my room. I, I didn't see him with my natural eyes, but I knew I knew immediately who he was when his presence en entered. And it was like ugh, total reverence. And it wasn't that I didn't hear words for most of it. It was like, it is, you know, it's a soul to soul speaking. And he came to show me why I was experiencing what I was experiencing. Because that's how dumb I was. That is how, I'm sorry, but how ignorant I was. I had no clue. Because I had never read the Bible. I didn't know that it talked about all these things in the Bible. Which is, you know, anyway, just amazing. Because, you know, here I think, oh, Christians don't know this. You read your Bible. I mean, it's all there. But anyway, so he showed me. Like, will you... What do you think the consequences were to opening all these doors and doing all these things? You think there were no consequences? This is kind of the irony. On one hand, I totally believe in the spiritual world and the supernatural, but then I didn't expect there to be any consequence to everything that I was doing. I mean, it, it, it's totally, it doesn't even make sense. So he, he just showed that to me and it was just kind of an instant, instantaneous understanding, but it was very loving. It, there was no condemnation. And I'm not saying that there is no condemnation in Christ. It's for those who are following after the spirit and not the flesh, by the way. Um, but I, but I don't think, you know, anyway, God, Jesus is love. And so he, he has a way he will, it's not condemnation, but anyway, it doesn't mean you can do anything you want, but he, he teaches in a totally loving way. And I felt totally loved. I didn't feel judged. Um, but it was like my child, you want to know why this is happening? It's clear. This is why. Anyway, and I just, I just was so um, sorry. I just, it was just was so clear, and it was like, my God, I'm, I'm so sorry. Like, how, how could I do that? And, and I feel like even in that moment, like my soul turned to Him. Like I repented in that moment. I didn't know the biblical even definition of repentance, but I believe in that moment it just, it happened. His presence turned me, and I turned towards Him spiritually. And he said to me, seek me now. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Seek me now. Not everything else. That's beautiful. So what is your life? What has your life looked like ever since you mm. sought Jesus after that? Well, um, amazing, uh, wonderful. And not because when you accept Jesus into your life, everything magically works out. I don't want anybody... It's, it's again, it's not a formula and you don't accept Jesus because you want your life to be easy. For me, it was such, it, it was such a relief because as I explained earlier, um, I was desperately trying to fix myself my whole life. I knew I was broken and I had, I had no idea how to fix myself and every way that I tried failed. And then when I learned about Jesus, um, you know, he says, and again, I, I wanted to write the, the scripture down, so I didn't mess it up. But he says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke, not yoga, not something else. <laughs> Take oh, that's my good. Take my yoke. yoke yeah. And learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And that that's it that's what happened is that i realized that i do need a savior and that is who jesus is he is who he says he is and that was also you know it's very antithetical again in this new age philosophy of you creating your own re reality to have a savior it's like that's considered very weak you know what, what do you mean you you save yourself no you don't so it was a huge relief Oh, Jesus, thank you. Thank you that you are who you say you are and that you came here to, to take this from me. And so it's been, you know, it's the process of sanctification, of learning how to give it to him. And it's a daily process. But what I did immediately was, and I'm so glad that you keep bringing that sister up because she is um, a blessing from heaven because I it was the Holy Spirit I know now that told me contact that sister. Of course, 
first, first I told my husband and my husband was actually very receptive. God bless him. And he said, well, I think we should find a church because we like literally have no Christians in our immediate life or even a good example of like who we could talk to or follow or go to their church, you know? So he said, well, let's find a church so we can at least talk to some people. And then I contacted that sister who coincidentally lives in Arizona. And I told her what happened. And she immediately sent me like some testimony videos. Um, one of them being Stephen Bancars, who was a big new age guy, probably heard of him. Um, and then she connected me with her minister who runs a deliverance ministry. And we did a deliverance, an initial deliverance over the phone. And she instructed me, you know, everything connected to anything occult, every instrument, every book, every tool, my tuning forks, my color scarves, everything has to go. And so then it became a process of doing that and then disconnecting from quitting yoga and saying goodbye to that, letting my sound healing teachers know I am no longer um, connected to this. This is not for me. And it's, that's what it looked like. And at the same time, we were living in this house. Our rent was too high. Um, our lease was going to be up in June. We had, we just didn't have enough money to be surviving there. We had no idea where we were going to go. And I got this phone call and I, and honest to God, my husband and I had forgotten we'd even done this, like, I don't know, a year or two before we had signed up for like, um, uh, like help with how they have these apartments and it was it's on this island where my husband was raised and they have it's like subsidized housing sort of but it's like um you can sign up to live in one of these apartments that's affordable because everything's so unaffordable and at my uh, mother-in-law's behest we had signed up you know just like okay fine we'll do that well we get this phone call like three weeks later after i'm saved this woman is saying um we have an apartment it was perfect for a family of four, you know, on this island, which we were actually trying to get back to, but we're like, there's no way we can get there because you have to be wealthy to live there. Um, would you like to come see it? And anyway, long story short, it was like, God has just guided and led our path. My husband is now saved. You know, we, we belong to an excellent church, um, Bible believing, but spirit filled. I mean, it's just, it's just been a journey. I've not stopped growing. I've not stopped running, running after God, um, because I just, I want to know him. I want to know him. Amen. Amen. And I can tell just by, by listening to you speak and seeing your emotion, how much you are in love with Jesus Christ and praise God, your husband is saved with you. So you have a saved household. Um, Candace, this is beautiful. How can people reach out to you if they want to reach you? I know you have a YouTube channel. What's the best way they can find you? Yeah, they can find me on YouTube if you just search Candace Sumera, The Walk. My channel is called The Walk. So I turned I turn that New Age channel into the Holy Spirit. Many months later, um, it told me he wanted me to share my testimony. So that was how I initiated that. And then it's been three and a half years. And when I feel the Spirit moves me, I get on there and I share stuff about my walk. Um, so you can reach me that way, or you can also email me at candacesumera at gmail.com. And um, I'd be happy to correspond with people that way. Great. And I'll put all that information in the description below. Okay. Candace, could you, in this out in prayer, could you pray for everyone who is trapped in the occult, not even realizing it is the occult, or even if they know us, if it's the occult, um, could you pray for those trapped in we're not trapped, but us who are stuck in yoga and Reiki and all the other things you mentioned and Scientology, because all these are false. All these are false gods and false worships, because we all know that, or we don't all know, but we are worshiping beings and we are to worship the creator, not the created, not the universe, but worship Jesus. So could you lead us in prayer and pray for those who are now realizing I've been worshiping the wrong thing. I've been serving the wrong thing. I've been going around about things the wrong way to reach God. I am not God. I'm only limited. So could you just pr please uh, pray for those who need this prayer, who needs to be delivered from the occult? Yeah. All right, Jennifer, I'll do my best here. Um, all right. Heavenly Father, we just we want to lift up every soul to you right now who is lost who's lost in the occult, who's lost in uh, deceptions of the enemy, who thinks that they are, they are in the light when they're actually in darkness. 
Lord, we just pray for revelation. We pray that you would touch their hearts and their spirits, that you would you would draw them to you the way that you drew me and so many others. We're just we're praying for salvation for the multitudes and we're praying for every Christian listening now that you would search their souls and bring to light anything in them that might be an idol or something that is stealing their attention their devotion away from you that you would re that you would convict people to recommit to to their pursuit of you lord and of heavenly things and we just pray that you would help us to be the salt of the earth and a light and lamp to others feet that 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 we would lead people, that we would help with your strength, Lord, and your guidance, help lead people out of darkness and deception, that you would give us discernment and wisdom and um, just salvation. <laughs> we pray for salvation, Lord, for all the lost souls. And we're, we also want to bless uh, Jennifer and this podcast and for all the people that she reaches, Lord. We just pray for continued favor and blessing over her and for everyone who comes across this podcast. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Candice, thank you so much for sharing your amazing, life-changing testimony. <laughs> thank you.